lots of other videos. I've done the archery, I've done painting, I've done travel, I've done all sorts of different things for you and had great fun doing them. But the one that I haven't done is a, an actual in more detail um, shooting one. A shooting shotgun that is. Shot went to rifle in too much detail, just um, discuss the differences between the two. So what I'd like to do now is a series of short uh, films, making up a whole one of course, where I'll show you as much as I can about the basics. I won't go into too much but I still need to give you lots of detail. Um, about shotgun shooting and about the shotguns. Let's start with what the shotguns are and their history and how they evolved and the differences between shotguns and rifles. And then we'll look at the techniques, measurements and all the things that you will need to know if you're thinking about starting up the sport. And of course paramount in all of that is going to be safety. I've got various qualifications as you can see here because I've been shooting for very many years, both refereeing and coaching qualifications. So I'll try and share as many of those as I can with you. I'm getting uh, more arthritis now, far more difficulty with my arms and hands, even in putting guns together like that. So although this is my light 12 bore, I have moved on to a much lighter 20 bore as well because I can see the problems arising. So while I've still got the energy and I've still got just the facilities to do so, um, I'll show you as much as I can about shooting. I've given up on pottery now, I can't do archery anymore because of my problems, but at least I can make one last film to share these skills with you. off this pigeon winter season uh, we're going to go back to the original spot just in the corner and along the hedge there um, or against the fence 
just looking out, not far from the car. I'm just going to wait. We've got a few pigeons coming in here since. But they're not coming in as close as I'd like. That one did. There's a handbag down here. Right, hi there. We'll carry on then, and I'll start to share the knowledge that I have with you over all these years of shooting. 
uh, the various parts of shotguns, uh, how they're measured um, and what you need to have, the accoutrements you need to have um, to go with them. You see here I've already got a gun slip, some cleaning equipment to show how to do that, um, things for adjusting uh, the stock to get them the right size for people that I'm coaching and safety equipment. We'll start with the difference in the two guns I've got here. Both of these are over and under shotguns. You can see that one barrel is over the other. And if we were to look at different types of shotguns over the years, they started off with single barrels and then they had the barrels side by side and then they eventually moved on to the over and under. Here's a typical example of a side by side game gun. Where the stock joins the barrels, there's a mechanism. These can be box lock or side lock or semi-auto or other mechanics. Uh, in this case you see at the bottom a, a box lock uh, ejector which has been made to look like the more expensive side lock but in fact has a side plate and just to the right of it a proper um, side lock ejector. Next we come to the pump action shotguns and the semi-autos respectively. The pump action works by actually pumping the cartridges out with the fore end and the semi-auto ejects the cartridges automatically by using gas from the shotgun. Now legally these are only allowed to have three shells two in the magazine and one in the chamber. But if you have a firearm certificate, you can have a shotgun which allows five shells. And then finally, there's a single barrel shotgun and of course the over and under, as I shall be demonstrating with here. Unless the gun is a pump action or semi-auto, it's unlikely you'll be able to use more than two shells. Here's an example of a very unusual gun where three shells are allowed three barrels. At first, it was considered uh, not really au okay fait to have um, an over and under shotgun on a game shoot but they've now become accepted everywhere. And in fact, I prefer an over and under because the uh, lower barrel is directly in line with your shoulder and the recoil is slightly less. Although the side-by-sides are very pointable and I still, you know, I do use side-by-side and have enjoyed the use of them in the past. So over and under and side-by-side and the different types of shotgun that we actually have. I've just shown you some details of those, but let's go into the history of guns now. Black powder or gunpowder originated in China and some of the earliest guns were simply a tube loaded with the gunpowder and then uh, a projectile placed inside which would be pushed out by the exploding gunpowder. These then become more evolved as you can see here with the flintlocks of percussion guns. The flintlock used a piece of flint against steel to create a spark and set off the gunpowder whereas the percussion was the beginning of the modern bullet or cartridge in that it had a uh, priming cap which went on top of a little tube and then when hit by the percussion hammer set off the uh, gunpowder. Next I'll explain how the barrels were made. With these earlier barrels they were called Damascus and they were done by welding together or heat welding and hammering together twisted rods of iron and steel around a mandrel or central rod. The simplest of these was called twist Damascus which is just the two simple rods twisted and wound around the mandrel and hammered with heat. But the more uh, expensive and the more detailed and prettiest were the rose pattern where they weren't just twisted but twisted back onto themselves into various patterns almost like a rose pattern along the barrel as you can see here. These barrels were then chemically browned or rusted and then uh, coated with a thin coat of uh, beeswax to protect them. Modern gun barrels are made quite differently lengths of special steel are not drilled by drilling into them but they're actually turned against the drill so the whole rod of iron the whole barrel is turned and forced down onto the drill which then goes perfectly down the center and instead of browning the barrels they're chemically blued or made black gunmetal black now in looking a little bit more closely at these guns there are two here one is a 12 bore that's this one which is slightly larger than this one I've actually cut the stock and repolished and got the stock the same size for myself and that measurement is quite important. Now why are they called 12 bore and 20 bore? So if I made 12 balls that fitted exactly inside that barrel they would weigh one pound in weight and the 20 bore the same would be 20 balls and 16, 16 bore, uh, balls of, of lead to make one pound in weight. Difference between 4 and 10 where we're talking measurement rather than weight. So that's why it's called a bore. Now the, the barrels are actually a cylinder but at the end of the cylinder here they become slightly narrower and that's called a choke. I'll show you now on the demonstration. On the top barrel left here you can see that it's slightly thicker than the lower barrel. The lower barrel is the wider choke. So we've got an even tube all the way along the barrel and then at the end it constricts and this will also constrict the shot pattern. Constricting the shot pattern will mean that as it comes out of the barrel it will remain narrower longer if it comes out of a narrower choke than a wider choke. Here's the basic set of chokes. So in this case the full cylinder on the right is the tightest choke you can have which will keep the shot pattern narrower for a longer distance. The cylinder is the most open cylinder and the pattern will widen out more quickly. 
I think too much importance can be placed upon this. For most shooting we can get away with quarter and half chokes. We don't need all these fancy multi-chokes which you can buy. A multi-choke means that you can actually screw in to the tip of the barrel different constrictions of choking. For the specialist it may be important, but for most of us quarter and half will do adequately. I will discuss choking a little more when I discuss cartridges later on. In my illustrations here I'm trying to show you how the shot comes down the barrels and is then constricted by the chokes and spreads out as it comes out. Possibly you can see here the uh, right hand of the two barrels is slightly narrower and smaller because it's a 20 bore rather than the 12 bore on the right, but the under barrel is slightly wider than the upper barrel. The upper barrel is the choke, the under is the first one you would pull the trigger on. Now we move on to cartridges and your choice of cartridges is very important, even to the point of it can be dangerous to use the wrong ones. We've already seen how easy it is to slip a 20 bore cartridge into a 12 bore chamber, that's where the cartridge goes in. So let's look at what we have to remember when we're doing this. We need to know the size of shot that we actually require for the purpose it's going to be used for. It might be a very heavy BB for shooting geese, it might be sixes or sevens for shooting pheasants and pigeons, or it might be sevens to nines for shooting clays. Not only are the shot different in uh, the weight and sizes, but also the amount of uh, powder or the charge behind the cartridge. You might have a 28 gram or one ounce load for clay shooting, or a 30 gram load for uh, game shooting, or a 32 gram for ducks and geese for wildfowl. You also need to find out which cartridges best suit your gun. Fibre wads give a slightly different pattern to plus wads. The plastic wads tend to hold them a little bit tighter in the pattern. We'll discuss pattern in just a moment. You can test your shot or your pattern against a pattern plate, which is a large steel plate, usually painted with white emulsion. And when you stand back at 30 yards and fire at a given point in that plate, you'll see where the spaces are in the shot pattern. If it's nice and even, a little more towards centre than out, then you're probably about right with your cartridge choice. But if there are large gaps in it, you may wish to try a different cartridge and see what the effects are with that. Shot sizes are denoted by a number. The larger the number, the smaller the shot. A number 9 for clay shooting is a very small shot, so you get more of them in the cartridge. A number 5 is larger and a BB larger still. And uh, the larger they are, the less shot there are in the cartridge, but the more impact they have upon a larger bird. So we'd be using a BB for geese. So a shotgun shell is totally different from a rifle bullet, which is a shell at one end and a bullet at the other, a single projectile that will go through a rifled barrel, where a shotgun cartridge goes through a smooth barrel. A shotgun cartridge has the primer, the powder and then the wadding, whether it be plastic or fibre, and then the shot at the far end, which will be propelled by the powder and wadding out of the end of the barrel. At the top of this page you'll notice a diagram of a Brennick shell. It's a cross between a bullet and a shotgun shell. It's a rifled bullet itself, so that the uh, bullet passes down a shotgun smooth barrel and because of the rifling in the bullet itself it will spin. A lethal projectile and quite accurate but illegal in England. I've already told you about chokes and how the end of the barrels constrict the shot, so the smaller the choke the narrower the shot pattern will remain at the further away it goes. The shot pattern comes out in the shape of a pair and gradually broadens out. If the pattern though isn't a good one, you'll see spaces in between like this. So you need to test your cartridges and your gun and find out on a shot plate, a pattern plate, which cartridges suit it best. Because at a distance, 30 to 40 yards, those holes could be as big as a pigeon and a bird could fly right through. Now let's take a look at the parts of the gun. They're very important for us to know because of gun fit and how the gun is actually used. First the stock. It's vital that the stock fits us, that it's the right length, and also that the cast is right. We'll deal with cast in a moment, as to whether it's bent slightly to the left or right, and that the height is right. The comb is the top part of the stock, and having this higher or lower will adjust how high your cheek is and how you look along the top of the barrel of the gun, along the rib. Next the barrels, of course they need to be in good order, and at the end of the barrels, at the muzzles, are the two chokes. We've dealt with those already. Legally the barrels of a shotgun cannot be less than 24 inches. A fast little game gun might be 26 inches. 28 inches is normal and 30 inches is often favoured by uh, taller guns or clay shooters. The rib is the bar that's fixed along the top of the barrels, either in between a double barrel side by side or on top of the over and unders. And it's that that we look along to sight to our target. At the end of the rib, where the muzzles are, is a small brass bead. That's the only sight we have. 
It's only used very basically. There aren't two sights like a rifle. The top lever is used to open and close the barrels. Pushing it across to one side opens the barrels up. The wrist of the gun is a part of the stock that the hand reaches around when reaching the trigger finger forward to pull the trigger. If the wrist of the gun is too long, then the person shooting may find it difficult to reach the trigger and pull the gun down or upwards. The type of finish of grip, in this case semi-pistol grip, is the way that that joint fits onto the main part of the stock. The action is where the main mechanics of the gun are housed. The firing pin, springs, everything else are all housed within this area. The fore end is the other wooden piece of the gun that actually helps to attach the barrels to the action or the stock. There are different types and shapes of fore end. I prefer the snarbel, which has this slight curve at the end. Next is the trigger and trigger guard. Obviously the trigger guard protects the trigger from being knocked accidentally. This is a single trigger on this gun, but many shotguns have two triggers, one for each of the barrels. In this case we can select which trigger we want. The butt is the very end of the stock that fits into our shoulder, and it may need to be extended or shortened. And the toe is the point at the base of the butt. The chambers are just inside the barrels at the top end, and when you open the gun, that is where the cartridges are placed. It's important to know what chambers you have, to know the type of cartridge or length of cartridge that you can use. You'll also notice on your gun the pressures that the gun is proofed to, so you know what power of cartridge you can use. The cheek of the stock is the outside face of the stock. As we've already discussed, at the muzzle end of the barrels are the chokes. In some guns they can actually be changed, and they're called multi-chokes and will unscrew. The muzzles are the very end of the barrels. And last but not least, nearly always on the top of a shotgun, is the safety catch. I say last but not least because the safety catch is not the only safe. It's only a, an extra additional safety feature. Always make sure the safety catch is on until you're going to raise the gun to shoot. In some guns, the safety catch also selects which barrel you're going to fire. In many of the over and unders, you slide it from side to side to choose the over or under barrel. So let's do a simple test on this 20 bore stock to see if it's a right or left hand stock. Now let's take a look at the cast on the gun. That is the curve of the uh, stock as it goes to the barrel. This is a right handed gun so it should cast off to the right here so that my right eye will look along the centre of the barrel here. With this piece of ticker you can see that you can see that the actual cast comes off to the right here. And if I were to take some pieces of card, we'd see it just as clearly. So if I put a piece of card here, we can see that that stock touches just there. If I put the piece of card here, you can see it comes away and there's a gap there. So the cast of the stock is coming this way. If you're a left-handed gun, you would want the cast going that way to the left. So a right-handed gun, you want the cast this way. So let's look at how we'd measure this gun to fit you. It's very important you have a gun that fits you. It has to be the right length in stock, it has to be the right length for your finger to reach, and it has to be right when your cheek goes down onto here that the eye is looking along the centre top rib. Here we have a phosphor bronze brush and my mop ready for cleaning. Also require a tin of spray oil and the main oil, gun cleaning oil, for actually cleaning out the interior of the barrels. Well, we've been through the parts of the gun, and I feel now it's time to look at something that might sound fairly simple, but actually I can make it a lot easier and more efficient for you, simply cleaning your gun after shooting. All we're going to need is some ordinary toilet paper, tissue paper, two pieces for cleaning out the inside of the barrel, and just three pieces for cleaning out the outside. Um, I'm going to show you the rifle and the shotgun, Let's start with the rifle scope and it better be fairly careful. But to clean the rifle, all we're going to do is pull back the bolt, pull on the trigger and the bolt will then come completely out. This then means that we can take the oil, don't have too much everywhere, just lightly spray the, the bolt, making sure that the oil does get into all the little cracks and crevices. And then, rather than have too much excess on, wipe off any surplus. We just want to make sure that the oil gets into the, the recesses. And at the very end, we can take a little bit of the heavier cleaning oil and just make sure that that goes into the working parts. And again, just wipe those over. Now, with the rifle itself, 
we need to take off the silencer or the sound moderator so that just unscrews. That will come apart if you really want to clean it after a while. It does tend to get full of um, old burnt powder and stuff. You take off the end here completely and you will find that inside, and this one hasn't been done for a while obviously, you can see it's pretty filthy, inside there will be a series of springs and washers. All of those can be taken out and the, the whole sound moderator can be cleaned out. So once that's done and brushed out and cleaned up, then you'll put the cleaning rod down through the barrel and we'll clean out with the fossil bronze brush first and then finish off with the mop with the correct uh, cleaning rod, which I'll now explain with the um, shotgun ones so that you'll know that it's, it's very, very similar. Having finished that and wiped over the surface of the outside as well with little oil and so on, then that's it, you're ready to go back to use again. So within the sound moderator there's a spring, a washer and a whole series of these washer shaped um, rings which help to make our silencer obviously quiet. The idea is that as the pressure comes through here it comes, it, uh, the pressure hits all of these little bands and bounces against the spring but what does happen is gradually as you see here if I use a knife you can see this happening that they gradually get coated up with all this old powder and burnt residue. The best idea is to just get a knife and come in and just clean them off because gradually that's going to fill up and eventually they will completely clog and the whole thing will be completely useless and you can see it's like lime scale it's, there's a lot of this stuff on here so it needs cleaning up quite well. You could then use a small wire brush if you wanted just to, to finish off tidying them up but inside here look there's an awful lot of mess which you really don't want to be in the rifle. You get it all out it'll last for a year or so afterwards you don't need to keep doing this but this is a second hand sound moderator so it's um, fairly old and has had a lot of use and needs all of these rings doing. Take a little bit of time but I take a bet that this has never been done by any of the previous owners and it works very well actually. When you've done that, I'm not even going to wire brush these because I'm sure that when I've used my knife this will be enough to clean each one and when I've cleaned each one up properly and got all of this stuff off the best I can with the knife it's imperative that we get every little bit out then uh, what I shall do is give it a little spray with the spray oil so I'll get them all done and then I shall go back and do as I'm doing here and spray every single one that's better get all of this rot out of here get it back like new and then at the end of it all just to keep them dry a little spray of oil on each one of them and that will then go back into the silencer tube once I've cleaned that as well. Now, this is a 12 bore cleaning one and it'll just fit there nicely, look. I'm going to go in there with that and clean out this tube and you see the muck that's come out from there. I should need to clean this off well before I go back and do my shotgun as well. So there we go, that's given that a good clean out as well, never been done in its life I'll take a bet. And again, just spray a bit of oil down there, get it all cleaned up nicely, that's better. That'll work very efficiently now and then we'll put back in these rings, tap them down. The inside here is a chamber which is empty, a bit like a car silencer and then these washers which are the baffles will go into this top half. Now just look at the amount of rubbish that's coming out of these. 